Thanks. Well, thanks for having me here today. Um, the last time I addressed this SSC um, previously, uh, first time it was about 2007, about my, my experience of anomalies in crop circles. And then the year after that, I came back and talked about uh, what remote viewing tells us about UFOs. And Roger Nelson has been twisting my arm every year about what I'm going to present next. So thanks, Roger. And I also have to thank Dan Sheehan for some conversations about this topic last year. So I've been looking for ideas and theories that explain some of the phenomena that we talk about, the things we're interested in in this society. And I haven't really come up with anything except recently I came across the idea of m many worlds, uh, many worlds interpretation, so I thought I'd investigate it. So where does this begin? It actually, interestingly enough, has its genesis with the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, because um, if you know anything about the Copenhagen interpretation, it tells us it's considered a non-realistic model because it tells us there's a separation between the macrocosmic world, which we experience personally, and the microcosmic world of subatomic particles. And basically, it goes even further to tell us that there is no quantum world, there's just quantum description. And people who were associated with uh, Niels Bohr and his assistants basically told us, don't look to quantum mechanics to explain anything else out of quantum mechanics. It's not, there's no quantum world, there's just quantum description, and all we need are classical measurements to tell us about the quantum world. Um, basically, what Bohr said is that um, we're just reformulating classical mechanics to adapt for the, you know, to the existence of the quantum of action. Well, a lot of people found this kind of uh, not very satisfactory. And um, there are two main challenges to Copenhagen. And I know people have different ideas about what Copenhagen is, but we only have 10 minutes, so we have to kind of keep it simple. One is the preferred basis problem. If everything at the basis of reality is generated from the Schrodinger wave equation, why don't we see a kind of smeared out featureless wave-like reality? Why do things appear solid? Why do they take the features that they do? And that's, why does it appear to us the way it does? Secondly, uh, this is what Schrodinger referred to as jellyfishication. How come we don't observe the macrocosmic superpositions? Why do we see things with particular colors they are, the temperature that it is, and so forth? Secondly, the problem of infinite regression. Um, where does observation end? I mean, if someone's observing an experiment, what about if something, someone's observing the observer? Or where does it end? This is called infinite regression. I mean, if, if this were true right now, I'm observing you and I'm collapsing all your quantum waves, in a sense. You're getting very small. So, uh, so those are two challenges. And von Neumann came up with one idea to deal with this, which was to create the idea that there's a wave collapse, which some people refer to as the disappearing worlds theory. Because when we take a quantum measurement, we see a particular uh, measurement from our classical measuring apparatus, but all the other states in the quantum wave disappear. Some people call it, don't ask, don't tell. So where do they go? OK? So the von Neumann proposed that everything does evolve at a subatomic level you know, over time from the Schrodinger wave equation, but that the act of measurement arbitrarily and instantaneously projects one element onto classical reality. It's still very dependent on classical reality. It's that your abstract ego, whatever that means, is what collapses the wave function. Hugh Everett III um, didn't find this very acceptable. He accepted the first axiom that we find the Schrodinger wave equation at the microscopic level, but he said that wave collapse is an ad hoc idea that's more metaphysics than physics. You're just throwing this in to make it seem to make sense, but there's nothing in physics that tells us there should be wave collapse. So he proposed a universal wave function in which the Schrodinger equation describes microscopic reality and macroscopic reality simultaneously. He wrote a dissertation about that, which was later re, uh, retitled by uh, Bryce DeWitt, the Bryces, and they called it the many worlds interpretation, but he called it the universal wave function. Now, very interestingly enough, on page six, in a footnote, he refers to von Neumann's idea of psychophysical parallelism, which is really the kind of genesis of the multi worlds idea, because what von Neumann told us is that Subjective states are equal to objective physical states. From a physics point of view, subjective phenomena are equally real to objective phenomena. They referred to extra physical processes, whatever. People have different interpretations of what that means. But he kind of created this idea that there are alternative possibilities. So Everett believed that quantum mechanics should stand on its own, the many worlds interpretation, without reference to observers or classical dynamics. The observer is in a superposition too. The experimenter is in a superposition. The measuring equipment is in a superposition. 
So all of these are real realities. And the way Everett dealt with it is said, it's not that the system is affected by the observer. It's the observer who becomes affected by the system. All the realities are real that are described by the superposition. And in, in, in this world, quantum entanglement is just correlation. And so he basically tells us that we're constantly splitting off every nanosecond into different branches. We're not aware of the splitting. And we're being pulled into the quantum wave at every moment in a superposition. So we're ourselves in a superposition, but we only see, excuse me for a second, a s small sliver of it. The observer forms a trajectory, not a line. So there's the classical Copenhagen interpretation, and there's Everett interpretation, constant branching. But Everett said that these branches never interact again, so it's not very satisfying for most of us looking at these phenomena. A newer version of this, um, and we have to go over this quickly because of the time, is the many interacting worlds view, known as MIW, which says all quantum phenomena are the outcome of a near infinite number of interacting parallel realities that already exist. Basically, this model is what has quantum mechanics done for you lately? They basically, these, these people, uh, Hall, Deckard, and, and Wiseman from Australia, basically argue that you, we can reproduce all quantum phenomena from the interactions of parallel realities. The quantum wave is an epiphenomena of interaction between near parallel realities. Unlike Everett, where these realities are generated every nanosecond, these all, uh, parallel realities are considered to pre-exist from the beginning of time. There's a near infinite number of them, and they're not quite parallel because they do interact. So it's kind of a combination between Bohmian dynamics, except instead of one pilot wave, there's a multidimensional pilot wave, and Everett's many worlds interpretation. Parallel realities interact when they're in similar configuration spaces. They create very small repulsive pressures on our own reality that gives rise to all quantum mechanical processes. The uh, people that are researching this have calculated through simulations that 41 parallel realities per electron are enough to reproduce many quantum experiments, including double, uh, double slit and quantum tunneling, zero point energy. And this is the simulation of the double slit experiment purely from parallel realities alone, 41 parallel realities. The reason it doesn't match exactly is this theorem works in what's called the continuum limit, which means we don't have an infinite number of parallel realities in the simulation here. This is just 41. But it looks pretty close to what you see from double slit. Now, I just did some quick calculations. And if we're 99% of our body is hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, we would, we would have 2.3 times 10 to 28 electrons in our body. And that means we could be react, uh, interacting with 6.2 times 10 to the 29 parallel realities, potentially, at each moment. Now, I, I know that's way over-exaggerated. But this is what this theory is talking about, for real, no joke. 620 billion, billion, billion parallel realities. Now, here's one of the most interesting statements. I mean, if the von Neumann statement about psychophysical parallelism is, is interesting, this is what they say. It's not part of our theory, but the idea of human interactions with other universes is no longer pure fantasy. I mean, that really stopped me when I saw that. These are you know, peer-reviewed mainstream physicists saying, that, physicists saying we interact with parallel realities. And I think that this has really big applications if you think of this type of phenomena that we study, because it's basically saying that all of these types of phenomena are a result, take your pick, and we don't have time to go through them here, a result of bleed through from parallel realities. This is what they're telling us. And I, got, I think this theory got a little boost from, Larry, uh, boost from Larry Dossi's talk, because basically what they're saying is similar configuration spaces. They don't have to be close physically, but similarly configured interact more often, and that's what Larry was telling us with his study of twins. The more that things are similarly structured, the more you're going to get this type of bleed through. And another feature of MIW theory is that non-local effects don't only come from parallel realities, but from high degrees of correlation, what they call super non-locality from our own reality. So this might include some PK and some types of remote viewing. Um, so we don't need parallel realities for non-local effects. They come from both our reality and from parallel realities. Now, if you like the idea of this, you're going to have to let go of the paranormal, because this theory is saying that paranormal is normal in a world of multiverses. You're going to get bleed through, so you better get used to it. If you don't like the idea of bleed through, just find another multiverse where it doesn't happen so much. <laughs> this, is, this is really what they're saying. So basically, they're saying the multiverse is an ultra-weak but highly precise superstructure of which we only perceive a, a tiny fraction at any moment. 
quantum mechanics isn't the fundamental reality multiverse interactions are. It's basically saying that what we have is that uh, we see the internet that's a toy compared to this huge interaction of multiverses which produces what we see what seems to be quantum waves. And one cool thing that drops out of this seems to me is perhaps dark energy. I didn't get a picture of it because no one's seen it yet. <laughs> I can't. But dark energy, we're told, is repulsive forces. This theory works from repulsive forces too. And maybe human creativity, because perhaps geniuses and people that come up with really creative ideas are simply perceiving parallel realities that are very close to us, but we normally don't perceive them. You, can, you could work with that idea. Imagination can be seen as a real parallel reality. Consciousness, it's spread out. Now, I have to thank Russ Targ, in a sense, for this, because at um, the Irva meeting a couple of years ago, he said quantum mechanics, uh, remote viewing has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It exists because you're a very large being that spans space and time. And this is kind of saying something similar, except there are lots of little beings over many parallel realities. So basically, MIW theory is the Ro Roman Inquisition's worst nightmare. I mean, this is saying things are infinite and we interact with them. Uh, not what they wanted to hear back then. At least now we don't get burned at the stake for saying it. And in, weirdly enough, it's kind of consistent with hidden variables, which Einstein talked about, the, the multivertes, uh, and Bohr, because it's saying that actually it's classical. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not hidden. And even Everett preserves the idea of relative states. So uh, basically, the conclusion is, if you believe this model, then reality leaks. And that's the type of reality we live in. So I think it's worthy of uh, consideration. OK, thank you. We have just a few minutes yes, for questions. Uh, well, don't everybody come roaring up here at once. Oh. Yeah, very cool idea. Yeah. Um, when you got the calculation of 10 to the 23rd, what was that referring to exactly? Parallel realities that you'd be interacting okay. with, just you counting your electrons, because this is kind of a physically based pressure model based on particles. Okay, so those are basically the number of electrons in the human body? Based on their calculations of how many parallel realities per electron you need to recreate what we call okay. quantum mechanics. Right, so now my question is, that, that's the number for a static situation. Now, this is a dynamic. Don't you have huge numbers of new uh, entity, new, new uh, possibilities that's emerging out of where, of somewhere, and that number then grows enormously? Absolutely. Am, I wrong, am I right or wrong about that? No, you're right. It, it, this is just, a, you know, it's just kind of a model, and that's just a minimum number. And obviously, we're not interacting with every possible parallel reality because it doesn't have anything to do with you. So if you had to look at the number you were interacting with, you'd have to scale it down a bit. But that's just looking at electrons. That's how their model, you know, is, is working. So uh, would the ability to make a quantum computer, or if it wasn't possible to make it, depend in some way on this? or? would you still be able to make a quantum computer in a leaky reality? Uh, that's a really good question, Winston. I don't know the answer to it. I mean, it would suggest that you would have to be correlated with other objects and things in the, uh, the space that you're working with, not the physical space, but the configuration space. But this model says that quantum mechanics isn't the fundamental reality. That's, it's just an interference pattern. It's an interference pattern between, like, you have strings and you're the harmonic in between it. And that it's there, but it's coming from something else deeper. Yeah. So I'm going to sort of dumb down the conversation a little sure. bit. I apologize no for problem. not being able to speak in your terms. Um, but I know that one visual metaphor that's really helped me conceptualize, I feel like what you're saying, although I could be totally wrong, um, and I, it's not my own idea. It was, um, it was someone else's. And, but anyway is this idea that um, it's, it's like a bunch of film, uh, like of a movie that's physical and like exists somewhere and every decision you make, you make a new film and that all of that already exists for all consciousness decisions and our consciousness is just like a speck that linearly walks along that film. And so where that speck chooses to go is our free will. The destiny is the fact that all those films have already been created. So I don't know if right. that helps anyone. That, that is it. You it, got it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Uh, we're now out of time. 